She began her vocal training as a child, studying classical and theater music. At 22, she began her professional career singing the music she had always been passionate about, rock and roll. Eventually, she would become one of the top-selling female recording artists of all time, with hits that included Love is a Battlefield, Hit Me with Your Best Shot, and Heartbreaker. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on this episode of Interviews, our conversation with multiple Grammy Award-winning artist, Pat Benatar. get used to the fame? I don't know. That's hard to say. I think that your life is this and you, you're you used to always being scrutinized and that people will say hello to you. And that part you get really used to. But the object of it, you know, why and all that kind of stuff, no. You just, nothing changes. You know, you're still you with a really cool job. You know, yeah. so you're still the person that grew up on Long Island and it doesn't really change that much. It's just you got this great gig and it's good, <laughs> you know. So, was it what you always wanted to do? Besides yeah, being well, a sex educator, I heard you wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, my, um, <laughs> I think I always wanted to sing. I think that what happened in the middle somewhere when I, I was studying to go to Juilliard was that um, I just panicked and thought that you know, why would I think that just because you know everyone says I'm like a really great singer for a kid and all that, why that would translate into the big pond, you know? So I think at that point I thought I would be more practical and I would, you know, go to college and teach school and ridiculous. And uh, <laughs> my kids go, Mom, you would be the worst teacher. <laughs> I have no patience whatsoever. But um, but I, I don't know, you know, it, it's in there and it's like breathing and I can't imagine not doing it ever, so... When you mention that sense of an insecurity, mm -hmm. does that ever totally go away? Are there times when you have the number one album in the country, it's gone platinum, when you think to yourself, am I really worthy of this? Do you ever have Oh, that? no, it's not insecurity. It was practicality. There, I don't have any <laughs> insecurity. That was never the <laughs> issue. It was never like, oh, I don't think I'm good enough kind of thing. I thought I was absolutely good enough. I just thought the probability of it happening was just numerically ridiculous, you know what I mean? It just didn't make any sense that out of all the people that were trying, there were so many people that were really great and why, you know, that kind of thing. But I don't have that. I don't have that inside, and it's not, it's not being immodest. It's just that I'm, a, I'm a, uh, uh, an implementer. That's my real gift that I have. Yeah. It's not so much that I think I have great talent, but I really know how to put one foot in front of the other. That's what I do really well. So it doesn't matter. I just put my head down and go. So it never was a question. If I chose it, I would do it, and it would be exactly where I wanted it. So it wasn't ever an insecurity like that. I just thought that, you know, that's kind of ridiculous, you know. Why would it be you? And, so. and the thing that strikes me funny when we talk like this is the fact that not only are you successful, they say you're one of the top recording female artists of all time. It's not just that you had success. It was monumental. <laughs> yeah, but that's just... That's just fate, luck, and a lot of, you know, good things. Things have to line up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you can only take credit for some of it. <laughs> you know, you got to do your part, but the rest is the universe. You know, it's got to, it all has to line up. So I just am grateful because, you know, all the things just went into place at the right time. True or false, one of these things going into mm -hmm. place at the right time. It was Halloween. You were in the remains of your Halloween costume mm -hmm. went on stage. Mm -hmm. Everything changed for you that moment. Exactly. That is true. That is true. Explain what happened. I had been, I had moved back to New York um, in 1975, and I, I auditioned to Catch a Rising Star, which was, um, you know, one of the comedy clubs in the group of comedy clubs, like the Improv and the, the Laugh Factory and all that kind of stuff. And um, I just got online like everybody else, and, and my number was at 2.45 in the morning. My number was 27. <laughs> And this was like, you know, they call it open mic night. It wasn't that glamorous. It's open mic night. You just kind of got up there and, and um, you know, you gave the sheet music to a piano player you had never seen before in your life. And you just did it. So I had, I had met Rick Newman, who owned the club. And, um, you know, we were kind of working. And it was, 
it was about 1977, and I had worked with, um, you know, songwriters, and we just kind of started. I explained to him that I wanted to do this thing. Um, I wanted to be this uh, female version of Robert Plant. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And um, everybody was like, I don't know. You know, they really weren't going for it, but he went for it. And you have to understand that for the past eight years of my life before then, I studied classical music only. So the transition vocally for me was huge, trying to get, stop singing like Julie Andrews, who I adored, and start singing like that, you know, like me now. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't that simple, but I tried to use everything that I had learned and just make the end product change. And it was going well. I was doing really well at night, you know, in the clubs and everything like that. But something, you know, you could still see that something was missing, and I kind of looked like Gidget. You know what I mean? I was like, you know, this kind of thing. And so I dressed up for this, for Halloween. And um, there's this horrendous movie called Cat Women of the Moon. I think Ava or Zsa Zsa, one of the Gabor sisters stars in it. But it was all about these women on a planet or on the moon. I don't remember exactly. It must be the moon, obviously. And they had big eyeliner and, and they wore these little suits and like, tights and little boots and I thought I'm going to be that for Halloween so I got a ray gun and I got totally <laughs> dressed up and I put this big makeup I, I mean I wore makeup but not like that and um, we went to, down to this place called Cafe Figaro and they had a Halloween contest and I won so then we decided oh let's all go up to catch it was all of us you know all the comedians and everybody we were all together let's go back up to catch and go on in our costumes so now <laughs> You know, it's like late. It's like, you know, in the middle of the morning, you know, not, you know, two o'clock, one o'clock in the morning. Everybody's, you know, New York is still jumping. It's going crazy. So we all just started performing one after the other. And when I got up, I did the same songs that I did every single night that were doing well. Yeah. But now it was unbelievable. The response was insane. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, now what could this <laughs> be about? And I'm thinking, no, it can't be like, it just, that's ridiculous. So I said, let me just do it one. Next day I did it again. Same thing. Never took it off ever. <laughs> wow. That was it. Because it just, it was the combo. You know, now it was all that singing and all that looking. And it, it gave just, a visual to the music. Yeah, it just, just went together. You know, it didn't kind of go before. I was looking, you know, like Rebecca Sunnybrook Foreman singing like, <laughs> you know, a train. So now the two things went together. But I've also heard you say that that persona now on stage mm-hmm. kind of is its own separate person than I who call you her are her her <laughs> yeah so what is she like compared to who she's you are she's great and she'll do anything <laughs> <laughs> she's great she'll do anything she is fearless and i'm much mellower and as a human being as a personal person than she is she's nuts and i love her and you she, said though but she can't go grocery shopping she doesn't know how to go grocery <laughs> shopping <laughs> she could <can> go <laughs> But yeah, no, it's just, it's just, you know what, and it's really, I think everybody does it unconsciously. I think everybody has a line between their personal self and their professional self. Mine's just really clear. You know, it's, it's, the delineation is very, very clear. Yeah. And it's perfect because I call it suiting up, you know, I don't really want to be here every day. This would be exhausting. You know, (laughs) I can't have this hair, this eyeliner, this like, you know, this constantly, I always, I always say that if. If I had to be a politician or if they made us not be able to point on stage, I'd have no career because my whole thing is about yelling at everybody and pointing. And, you know, if I had to do that, like, politically correct thing, I would, like, so, yeah. So she's great, but she has her place, you know. So you've you've come to the realization that a certain look with your sound is going to mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. You're moving forward in your career. Mm-hmm. I have to think that there's something in the message of your music that's connecting with the youth of that time, that's what really all gelled, that you somehow tapped into what was going on. Well, you have to understand that it wasn't, it's, it's not an individual person. You have to remember where the country was at this point. This was 1978, 79, 1980. The women's movement was in full force. Yeah. We were the daughters. We were the first generation of young women who grew up indoctrinated you know what I mean now we were adult women we were going to put this into practice this was not on paper anymore and you know in my house where I grew up my father worked you know two jobs sometimes three jobs when he came home from work he ate his supper 
We watched a little TV together. We said our prayers. That was it. You know what I mean? The man worked. He didn't do a lot of stuff around the house. All I ever remember is my mother and grandmother painting the house, <laughs> mowing the lawn, doing all that kind of stuff. So in my world, it wasn't even an option to me. It, it, there was no way that women were not the same as far yeah. as I was concerned and possibly superior as far as I was concerned. So that's how I went into the world. And, you know, I remember the first couple of times when people looked at me like I had two heads when I told them what I wanted to do. I was like, what's the problem? You know what I mean? Because they were just like, you can't do this. One woman can't sell out, you know, um, Madison Square Garden. And, you know, you, you can't be on the road like that. You're going to die and all this. I'm like, what are you talking about? It never <laughs> occurred to me that it couldn't be done, which was great because I was so naive. And, and you know, that just you're blind and you just go, you know, you have no fear. What was your parents' reaction to this? Well, my mother was not surprised because she thought I would be a stripper. So she was, (laughs) so she was very happy. She was happy. It swung this way. You know, she said, you never wanted to wear any clothes anyway. Jesus, you know, like this kind of thing. So, um, and I was always, you know, like a Jack Russell dog. I was this big and this big, you know, and fighting with everybody and everything all the time. I lived on a street where there were all boys and I just wanted to be in the club, and they would squash earthworms on my leg. That would be the initiation, and I would just, so I just, you know, she she was just happy I wasn't, you know, getting killed or <laughs> taking my clothes off somewhere, I guess. I don't know. What do you yeah. think was the pivotal moment when you realized it was all working, that you had, was it the first single, was it the first album? When did you think, yeah, it, it's happening? I think when I met Spider for the first time, because even even when I got signed, I got signed pretty shortly after, maybe within two years, I got signed to Chrysalis, and we actually began making the record. I didn't meet Spider yet. I didn't know him yet. And, you know, I explained it to them, and I, as a matter of fact, Elliot Randall and Paul Schaefer actually played on the original record that we started recording. And so we had all these, like, studio guys and everything, and, it, you know, it just... It wasn't what I meant. It just wasn't edgy enough. It was just kind of poppy. And I was thinking, okay, that's not it. This is not what I mean. They're not getting this. They're giving me the watered-down version of what they think a girl should be doing. They're not getting this. And then um, we switched gears, and, and we brought in Mike Chapman and Peter Coleman. And Mike Chapman, when I was sitting with him when I, on one of the first meetings, I was explaining it to him, and he was intrigued. He thought that this was a great idea because he was, he was doing, I think, Blondie at the time. So this was a female singer. He had lots of success, I guess, um, doing this with women, and um, he was really open to it. He was, he was kind of excited about doing it, and he said, he said yeah, yeah, but I, I don't, he goes, I understand what you're saying. I told him I wanted a partner. I didn't want to be like a solo artist girl singer with an innocuous band behind me. I didn't want that to happen. Faceless people. I wanted a partner. I wanted it to be like Robert Plant and Jimmy Page or, you know, Keith and Mick. I wanted it to be like this. He goes, I got this kid. He's 22 years old. He's playing in Rick Derringer's band. But he goes, I think he's about done. Let me send him down to you. (laughs) And he walked in the door and literally it was like like getting hit in the face with a two-by-four. I saw him and First of all, at a personal level, I was in love. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. I just, I just, I didn't, and I was trying to control myself, and I was looking at my manager and just like, I don't care if he can play. He is in the band. So that had he it. been ugly, the Pat Benadar career might never have happened, right? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> because the minute he played, it was so exactly what I meant. Yeah. But looking the way he did did not hurt <laughs> it him hurt. in any way. And it was incredible because we really... It was instantaneous for both of us. It was exactly what I was talking about. And he was so thrilled to be with with um, somebody who was fresh and new and had no preconceptions. He was like the old like player, even though he was younger than me. But because my experience in that kind of music and that genre of music was so limited, he was so experienced. I mean, he was like hanging out with Iggy Pop and doing all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And I was, you know, doing South Pacific, you know, so... The combo was absolutely perfect. I, that, I brought him into the middle, and he pushed me far to the left. Yeah. So. That love of that style, was that always with you? Oh, yeah. You knew I you could do it. the heart, I even mean, when you're I singing just, the opera and the yeah, cabaret. I mean, I, it never, I, I, honestly, when I was 
growing up, it never occurred to me ever to sing that. I never even like pretended with the hairbrush and the mirror. I was completely ready to be um, a classical singer, an opera singer. That's what I planned to do because yeah. that's my voice was suited to that. And I never even thought it was possible to change that. But I loved it. I mean, there were, you couldn't get a guitar loud enough as far as I was concerned. <laughs> you know, so. So it was, it was, when I figured it out, it was, it was like, yes. <laughs> Do you think that that past training helped support the voice that you were, oh, and that's yeah. what makes you It's the you reason different? I can sing. I'm 57 now, and it's the reason that I can sing. I have more power today than I ever had, and my voice is, people, I mean, this is what they say. They tell me that it's stronger and fuller and richer than it ever was, which should happen, because if you're trained, that's what happens. As you get, I mean, you're, when you're singing classical music, you're reaching your peak in your 40s and in your 50s. That's what happens. So, right. so it was truly a gift to be able to, to know all that and save. You know, I saved it. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't do any of those things because it wasn't allowed. You know, my I had a, I had a my voice teacher, <laughs> my choir teacher, Georgia Rule. She ruled with an iron fist, and there was. There was no swimming if it was below 70 degrees outside. Yeah. Mm -mm. She, was, she was just the best. Once fame took hold, it happened very quickly for you. It did. Once it started going, that ride was going fast. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, ever wish it had built slower? No. I mean, it was no. very exciting. And, um, you know, you prepare your entire life for that moment. It's what happens after... That you're not ready for. You yeah. have a lifetime to get ready for that first thing, you know, and then it accelerates, and you're just you're running after it for a really long time. But I wouldn't change it because it was very exciting, and you know, it really lent itself. It helped me to toughen up because I really was just from a small town. I was a nice girl, you know, and. They were ready to chew me up and spit me out. And, you know, in defense, it, I used to call it the gauntlet because every single day, every single day was some new thing. It was completely uncharted waters. <laughs> there was no handbook. It wasn't like, I mean, it's not that women didn't go before me. Of course they did. That's ridiculous to say that they didn't, but not in the same way. I had to go in this genre of music where only Janis Joplin went before mm -hmm. and Grace Slick. But, you know, it wasn't exactly the same thing. This was going to get wider. That was a narrow group in a narrow genre. This was now going to be a rock and roll thing that was going to spread out into a pop market, and it was going to get much bigger than yeah. that. So there was no one to, like, you know, mentor or me or anything like that. And literally every day I had to make it up as I went along. But it was good because it really made me hard and strong and really tough. Yeah. You talk about crap. those other artists, and yes, they had recognition, but you also had MTV coming along the no, same time. No, that's what I'm saying. The world and it's it, just that they notoriety. were monstrous. They, I mean, I wasn't interested in doing what they were doing. I really wanted to do what the men were doing. That's what I wanted. I didn't want it to always have that. I wanted the label to go away. I didn't want to say, wow, you rock great for a girl. girl yeah. You know what I mean? I, this is a band. This is it. That's Forget the gender thing. That's what I was going for. And what I meant when I said is that it was going to, about to get bigger and wider was because they were wonderful women. They did amazing work. Especially, it's like the person who invents electricity. Now, computers are great, but the guy who made it up <laughs> wins. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> so they win because they made it up. But I got to be the next thing and make up that section. Yeah. And, I, and, and MTV changed everything. You know, now, you had to, now it wasn't about like just singing good and you know, being live and doing all this kind of stuff. Now you had to like do great on video and you had to do all this. <laughs> now it was magazines. And now I, I dread the thought. My, both my children, both of our daughters, want to be musicians. And I, ugh, the idea of what they have to do now in order to like be good yeah. is like... I'm so not there. Okay, I have to ask, when you say videos, Love is a Battlefield, mm -hmm. an iconic video. Mm -hmm. So many. True or false, you really weren't comfortable with the dancing in it. Are you out of your mind? I'm so uncoordinated. <laughs> no, this took 16 hours of rehearsal, eight hours each day, and I was crippled by that time. <laughs> they said, we're going to have to bring a guy, and they, had, they brought in like a mis, uh, masseur, masseuse, whatever he's called, from... Um, 
the ballet. He came in and he was working. On, I mean, I, my toenails were hurting. I was just, <laughs> you know, I can like get up there and do my little thing. But, you know, this was like ridiculous stuff. And, you know, all these dancers, they do this all day, all night. And I could do one thing at a time. I could dance when they said to dance. But when I had a lip sync and dance together, <laughs> no, this was not working. So this took a really long time. <laughs> when you see that video or any of the videos from that period, right. What do you think? What do you feel when you see them back? Um, I, it Can you makes enjoy me, them? Or? Yes, it makes me laugh. I love them because they're hilarious. I mean, it's just, it's just hilarious. And um, I love it because it captures the era right to a T. You know, it's yeah. like there forever. If anybody has any questions about what it was like, look at that. Because that's exactly what it was like. And it, it's just really fun. It's like looking at... Um, you know, uh, pictures from kindergarten. You know, you yeah. love them. They're cute. And you just laugh because it's it's absolutely ridiculous. And <laughs> poor Spider, you know, the rest of the guys, they were absolutely opposed to this because, you know, this was like a new thing too. You know, it was okay for Michael Jackson to do this kind of stuff, but like not <laughs> yeah. us, you know. And I remember when we were doing You Better in the, the direct, And that was just a live performance and they were flipping out. We're not doing this, you know. And, rah, you know, they're going crazy and we don't want our songs on a video. We want people to interpret them <laughs> themselves, you know, and I, because I had no, I wasn't tied to this like thing that they were all tied to. I was like, come on, it's just like a character. Let's do it. You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> they wanted to kill me, but I remember that part of me still was not into that play acting thing with your songs, you know, and yeah. the, the guy turned on this big wind fan during, <laughs> um, you better run. And he said, okay, I, now just go and I just remember looking at him going I don't go like this and that's that face is on there they're filming it and I'm so pissed I'm just like oh you know the whole time so it was weird but um after we did Shadows of the Night historical costumes were banned forever <laughs> <laughs> that that's where it. they drew the line we're done now <laughs> that's why they're not in battlefield <laughs> when you talk about the different sounds of your time too. I think that's one thing that I really enjoy mm -hmm. about your catalog of work is the variety of sounds. It's not just, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think, oh, it was hard rock at the time. Right. There's such a variety there. That's Spider. That's all him because he's just, he's really the visionary. I mean, you know, I write the songs too and I do all that kind of stuff, but he's the one who, who pushes to go further than I'm willing to go. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm good. You know, he, he's like, no, no, no. You know, I'm always like, Come on back. I'm always trying to reel him in, but it's really good because he really pushes all of us to do that kind of stuff. That's that's him all the time. He's the one. Battlefield was like a ballad. Yeah. You know, it was just like on a guitar, you're begging me to go and making me stay. And he just, you know, he started playing with that drum machine. And actually, the, the afternoon that we were going to record it, he didn't tell us. He, I knew what the song sounded like because I had the, the demo from Holly and Mike. But the rest of the band had never heard it. And he set us up in the parking lot of the studio where we were playing to rehearse. And then he played the drum loop and just said, play anything that comes into your head. <laughs> They're like, what you, we, they had no idea what it was at all. There was nothing. <laughs> and that's how the whole thing got, the whole, um, the bed of the song was built because they had no idea what the chords were. They'd never heard the song. Yeah. So we got all the bed of it going, and then we went inside, and he played the chords so that they could hear what it was. So, I mean, he would do some crazy stuff like that all the time. Before we run out of time, too, you married him pretty early on in the career. Yes. So you guys have done all of your work pretty much together. Yes. Married, children. children. People say you should never do that. <laughs> How do you make it work? Well, it's the only way we know. I'm not so sure that people should do that. <laughs> it's just that it works for us. That's yeah. how we met. It's the only thing we know. And it works. I Sometimes I think we're actually the same person split into two. <laughs> so it actually works really well. But he's really easy. He's really nice. And I'm the one who's like a lunatic. And he isn't. So that <laughs> yin yang thing is like, it's perfect. You know, and he's just, he's a, he's a great father. He's a good man. And musically, we're just you know, we're one person together, so So what works. direction are you going now? Musically, what can we expect? I don't know. You know, he's he's way more interested in continuing than me. Really? You know, I love singing. I love it. But, I, you know, we've done this for a really long time, and I like to burn it up and then <laughs> be done. You know what I mean? He likes to keep going, and I just want to, like, 
do it to death and be finished, you know. So I'm really interested. We're, we're, I'm about to write um, an autobiography, and I'm really interested in writing books now. And I want to do that, and novels, things like that. Um, I don't know. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to fan out a little bit. Performance, I performed to death. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't think that I could ever stop singing, but he'll come up with something, though, to make it interesting for me. You know, because yeah. I just, I get bored. I just get, okay, I've sung, how many more times can you sing Heartbreaker? I probably could sing it for the rest of my days, but there's some <laughs> of them that you can't. You know, um, I don't know, but he will come up with something because he knows, he's always thinking that's his job. Yeah. His job is to just, you know, he's not the foot in foot. Like this. That's not what he does. He's he's supposed to be over here making a mess. You know, my <laughs> job is to like gather it all together and and make it so humans can understand it. You know. And would you be bothered if he came in and said, "Listen, I've got a great project for the girls." No, I tell them every day. Okay, I've had enough. How about you carry the torch? What do you say? <laughs> Well, we are thankful for all the torch carrying you've done, the great music, all the wonderful years. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you for having me. Pat Benatar. To order a DVD of this episode, including a bonus interview with Neil Spider Geraldo, please visit HoustonPBS.org.